the way you desalinize water, is it still in the same way that it was 50 years ago or has there been um, more refinement in, in how they... You know, it's good that we have this uh, conversation here in Jeddah mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, the desalination history of the kingdom started in uh, the year 1900. Wow. Here in Jeddah, where the two first uh, thermal desalination privately owned were set up here in the kingdom. Do you work firsthand with the Ministry of Agriculture? Yeah, we do. What are they looking for? They are looking to save, uh, to save water to implement the more efficient technology in the management of the water. We need to think that we always speak about the, the generation of water, but uh, especially in this country, we have many cities in land. To produce one liter of desalinated water, you need to take two liters from the sea. One liter will be this potable water and another liter will be brine. To produce this water in the most efficient manner, lowering the consumption of energy and as well lowering the generation of waste in the production of this water. What do you tell your kids? How do you motivate them? What's your advice to them? To learn something new every day. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to another episode of the Mo Show podcast. We're in the studio here today with Mr. Julio De La Rosa. He is the business development director at Asiona. That's it. Is it a Spanish name? It's a Spanish name. How was my pronunciation? Perfect. Yeah, it was good? Yeah. <laughs> They're in the water desalination business, uh, something I don't know anything about, and I want to know as much as I can of it over the next hour or so. Thank you so much for joining me in the studio today. Thank you for inviting me for your home, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mo. Honors all mine, honestly. Why water desalination? Let's start there. Okay. Why water desalination? Why water? Because water is life. I mean, we cannot do anything without water. Um, why desalination? Uh, well, you know, we have to consider that 75% uh, of the earth is covered by water, but only 3% of this is usable for as a potable water, let's say like this. And only 0.5% Point four percent uh, we can use in reality because because two point five is either ice or is highly polluted. If we go to a country like Saudi Arabia and we consider that uh, we don't have uh, what we can say uh, abundant, reliable source of water, we have to look at the other ninety seven percent, the other ninety seven percent that is in the sea, and this is why desalination is so important. And because water is needed for everything, not only for human beings, but as well for agriculture, as well for industry. And if we uh, have a look what we have before us here in the country, you know, we have an estimation of uh, population growth between 9 to 10 percent from now to 2030. That will take the population to from the current 35, per 35 million people to 50 to 60 million people. So the demand of water is going to be growing significantly. And as well, if we have into account that uh, within the Saudi vision 2030, one of the main industry that want to be developed is the tourists, and the tourists at the end of the day is people. So we can realize how important is the, the water in this plant. And let me tell you something. Why are so many Spanish companies focused on desalination? And if you have a look to the topest company doing desalination plant in the world, you can find several Spanish companies, among them Acciona for sure. And this is back in the 60s and 70s in Spain, when you know the, um, the government decided that we need to bring foreign currencies. Uh, one of the few industry ca that can bring foreign currency into the country was tourists, because we have sun, we have night beach. So one of the fundamental needs that you need to provide to the tourist sector is the, to secure the supply of water. I mean, no one will go to any place in the world when you don't have the security that you are gonna have 24 hours supply of water on a spot. And this is why you see, you see, let's say, uh, the desalination uh, industry so heavily developed by a Spanish company because it's coming from the 60s. And Acciona was part of this, developing one of the first desalination plants in the Canary Island. So desalination because of this, because in, par in this part of the world where the, we don't have an alternative source of reliable water and potable water, I think that we need to look into the sea. What kind of projects are you guys working on uh, while in Saudi? 
Well, it's not only in Saudi, but all around the world, ACCIONA only is involved in projects that are sustainable and provide a positive impact to the society and to the environment. What does this mean? This means that ACCIONA is involved in renewable projects and as well is involved in providing potable water to the population through the salination and as well is involved in purifying sewage through the sewage treatment plant that we developed, not only here in the kingdom, but uh, all around the world. So in short, uh, ACCIONA is involved in projects uh, that uh, provide a positive impact to the environment and to the people. Among them is desalination and water treatment, renewable energy like solar and wind. Mm-hmm. Um, when uh, I think of desalination, uh, what comes to mind is these two towers that we had in, in the city of Jeddah, and I'll try to put a picture up of it now if, uh, if I can find, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be difficult to find one, uh, that they were, for the longest time, maybe 50 or yeah. 60 years, they dominated uh, the middle of the city's skyline, and you'd see them every day working and yeah. creating uh, a smoke smoke cloud over the city, and that's stopped now, and that area now is is, is going to be repurposed for, for something else. Uh, is the way you desalinize, desalinize water, I don't know if that's the correct way of pronouncing it, is it still in the same way that it was 50 years ago or has there been um, more refinement in, in how they, no? No, it's not the same. You know, it's good that we have this uh, conversation here in Jeddah mm-hmm. because uh, you know, the desalination history of the kingdom <coughs> started in uh, the year 1900. Wow. Here in Jeddah, where the two first uh, thermal desalination privately owned were set up here in the kingdom. And there is a big change uh, since that times. So now, you know, the kingdom is moving to a more sustainable and efficient technology that is reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is a membrane-based technology. It's not a technology based in the evaporation of the water, but in the filtration of the water. So this smoke uh, that you see is coming precisely from this because what we do is to evaporate water in the past technology, in the thermal desalination technology, what we do is to evaporate and condensate the water without salt. And this is why you see all this smoke. So today there is a big shift in the kingdom, little by little, replacing those old less efficient technology of thermal desalination by the new, most sustainable, friendly, with the environment, and efficient reverse osmosis technology. Yeah. Um, how many years have you put into Saudi Arabia right now? And can you tell us uh, what are some of the things that have surprised you both positively and uh, maybe negatively, if any? Well, I moved, uh, I moved to the Middle East uh, in 2011. I started living in, in, in Emirates for 10 years. Mm-hmm. It was five years living in Abu Dhabi, another five years living in, in Dubai. And uh, two years ago, I moved to, to Saudi Arabia. Okay, so positively for me is all the transformation I have seen in the society and in the economy in the last, I would say, five to six years in the country. How the country has been open economically and socially how the transformation in the society and in the openness of the country has happened. Um, and negatively, I, I would say, I mean, as so far, uh, I have not been able to identify nothing negative to me because I do understand that the transformation in the society and in the economy is happening little by little. And I would say I'm really excited to see how this ends under this uh, Vision 2030 and how this program is materialized and this is for what ACCIONA is being here as well to help to help the kingdom, you know, in the in the development of projects, sustainable projects, uh, yes, uh, to help the kingdom to materialize this vision 2030. Mm-hmm. Sustainability, something that is uh, a priority in 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 so many different entities and uh, and ministries these days in Saudi Arabia. What kind of relationship do you have with that word, uh, be it uh, on a personal or as far as Axion is concerned? What do you know? Uh, you know, sustainability already drive every single decision that is taken in ACCIONA. I mean, today in ACCIONA, we only develop that uh, will provide a positive impact to the planet and to the society. We think the only way to remain in the same situation we have to do and even to improve the situation we have is by developing sustainable projects 
as we mentioned before, either as a desalination plants and renewable energy. Me personally, I have a profound conviction about sustainability because we need to, let's say, the legacy that we need to give to our kids should be a planet in better conditions to the ones that we receive it. And I'm not saying the same condition because if we give them the planet in the same condition that we have today or we remain in the same situation consuming the number of resources that we are consuming today to have potable water, to have energy, and to do the activities that we have, for sure they will not last long. And we need to be sure that we give this legacy and we are treating fairly what we are giving, that is this planet. So sustainability is the way to secure that the legacy that we give to our kids is, uh, let's say, a better planet than the one that we receive it. How many plants so far have you opened in Saudi? And tell us a little bit more about the impact that those plants have had so far. Yeah, so far uh, we have here in the kingdom 14 projects. 14? Yeah, 14 projects Marshall we have. Law. Yeah, it's a significant number of projects. We have seven desalination plants. We have three wastewater treatment plants and we have, uh, let's say, we are operating the whole water cycle in the south region. You mentioned before Baja, mm -hmm. Narjan, Jisang and Baja. This is an area that is equivalent to 240,000 kilometers, 240,000 square kilometers. That is equivalent to the half of Spain, which is the third largest country in, the, in, the, in Europe. So you can imagine how important for us it is. And there we have a number of projects, okay? The impact we have is that shortly we are going to be producing 2.4 million cubic meters per day capacity of desalinated water. This is uh, equivalent to provide water to 10 million people. That is around 20% of the population today. We are providing treated water to the farmers. So this will be around 440,000 cubic meters per day. This is going to be saving fresh water and as well we are going to be providing to them what is uh, the sludge that we produce is going to be provided as well to the farmers and this is going to be saving the use of uh, pure chemical fertilizers and on the top of this this wastewater treatment plants are going to be fitted by renewable energy and this is why these three projects got what we think is a landmark achievement for us in the country that is that we secure the first green financing for all these projects and what is green financing? Green financing is a trend in the market today in which, uh, you know, you have to secure to the investor in the project that all and every SAR or dollar invested in the project is used only and only in sustainable projects. And this is what these three, design, these three wastewater treatment plants are doing. They are providing treated water to the farmers. This is providing a sludge that will avoid the use of pure chemical fertilizers. And all this, as again, as we said before, feed it by renewable energy. So we are very proud. This is what we are giving. We are giving potable water. We are improving the management of the of the water cycle, the whole water cycle, and we are providing treated water to mm -hmm. save uh, fresh resources of water. It's a fascinating industry, even more so for someone who comes with a cold eye like myself. I know nothing about the desalination industry, and okay. uh, and. Uh, Forgive me if some of the if some of the questions come off as silly or no, no, or obvious, sure. but um, bear with me. What kind of role do you, Julio, play in in putting all of this together and make it, making it all come to life? Well, my duty is to identify the opportunities as soon as possible, to understand the needs of the client, to know in which way we can secure the project and we can convince the client about, let's say, the convenience to develop uh, sustainable projects and to share this knowledge with the team, not only here locally, but as well in Spain, to define the best strategy for making a success uh, winning the projects. Um, not only winning the project because we want to make profit. This is something I would like to highlight, you know, in, in Acciona, when we develop projects, we don't consider only, let's say, the financial part as well. We need to put into the picture the non-financial aspect of the project. What is the benefit of this project is providing to the society and securing that this project is developed in the more sustainable manner, because otherwise we are not going to be there. I mean, Acciona no longer is going to be in a project that has not a positive, what we call environmental, social and governance evaluation. That is that the impact in the project is not 
let's say, a financial project. It's not only for the sake of making profit, but for sure to generate a positive impact in the planet and in the society. Do you work firsthand with the Ministry of Agriculture? Yeah, we do. Uh, what's that experience uh, been like? And what kind of work do you guys do with them? Do they facilitate? Do they, uh, how do they support? Well, under the Ministry of Agriculture, Environmental, Water and Agriculture, there are three main water bodies, the Saline Water Conversion Corporation, the SWPC, Saudi Water Partnership Corporate Company, and the National Water Company. We work with uh, all the three. The cooperation is, uh, is uh, really good because you know where what what are they looking for they are looking to save uh, to save water to implement the more efficient technology in the management of the water we need to think that we always speak about the the generation of water but uh, especially in this country we have many cities in land and um, the water one that is desalinated you need to carry on the water to the place in which it's consumed. And as well, to need, you, you need to assure that the losses of this water all the way from the coast to the point that it's consumed are lower and lower. And this is where we are working with all these bodies are working to optimize and to reduce the loss of water along the way. To produce this water in the most efficient manner, lowering the consumption of energy and as well lowering the generation of waste in the production of this water. And the experience has been very positive. We, we used to try to define, let's say, a cooperative approach, a win-win situation, because the success of the private company is the success of the client and the other way around. We used to define clear channel of communication with the client. This is very important. And we need to understand each other's needs. I mean, we need to understand what are, clearly understand what are the needs of the client and as well, the clients sometimes need to understand what are the needs of the private company doing the development of the project because making projects real is not an easy task. And for sure, we need the help of the, of the client always. Who's the client in this case when you refer to We them? have the three clients. We have the three clients I mentioned to you, the Saline Water Conversion Corporation, mm -hmm. the Saudi Water Partnership Company, and the National Water Company. We are working with the, the all three, and even the fourth, I forgot to mention, the fourth client is, is the Saudi irrigation organization that is the the body in charge of delivering finally the water to the farmers mm -hmm. uh f talking about farmers uh what kind of um interaction do you have with them and what's it like working with these people who are you know essentially the front line of this all well directly with farmers of interaction right right now doesn't exist okay. I mean, what we are doing is to provide uh, what we will do is to provide the sewage treated to the to SIO itself and to SWPC and they will deliver the water let's say to the farmer directly we don't have a direct contact with the final user so far challenges that you have faced you're not in your country you um, are working with people where there's a language barrier <clears throat> um, even though Yanni, you're, you're, you're obviously so knowledgeable about the, the business that you are in, but I'm sure there are days where you are, are, are challenged in so many different aspects, not just language, but even just maybe the way of doing business yeah. here is different to Spain or the UAE. Yeah. A any like memorable challenges that you can share with us? Yeah, for sure, for sure. You nailed the point. It's uh, one of the challenges we have is that uh, we are working and setting up teams that incorporate people coming from all around the world with different visions, with different cultures, different religions, different everything, okay, different ways of seeing the life. So it's, it's not easy because one important thing is that who deliver projects is not the company, but the people. The people is the one delivering the projects. Yeah. In our company, we put the people in the middle of everything because at the end of the day, the companies are people with knowledge. Nothing more, nothing less. The environment in which we work is not an easy environment to deliver a project and to do the construction of a project or to do our operation and maintenance of a facility is not easy. No. <clears throat> and you need to motivate the people in daily basis. And this is what, uh, what I would like to do, to be surrounded by happy people. If we don't have people, uh, happy people and people motivated, we will, we will not deliver the project, no matter what company you are working or True. what resources are pumping the company to you. And we put this under the umbrella of the ESG program that Acciona has. We need to, to motivate people. We need to make the people feel that they are important. From the tip boy to the project director, 
all of them are important. All of them are providing something to the project. All of them has value what they do in daily basis. We need to understand that uh, everybody that is smiling, maybe is building a problem. Everybody is, be is building a problem always. So this is important to talk with the people, to define to the people the right channel to communicate with the management of the project or with the management of the company, to listen to the people and to define goals to the people, which is your real target, where you should be focused to show them later when we reach this goal that what they did for the project or for the, let's say, for the execution or for getting the tender, the, whatever it is, has value for the company and is reward by the company. عجينه محضرة بشغل قوامها خفيف وهش وطعمها ولا اروع Um, I was going to say just human capital is uh, is such an important entity of any of any business because uh, it was actually a, a quote that my father told me. He said that the number one thing for any company is not the customer. It's your front line. It's your employees because they will determine the reaction to the customer on whether he's going to come and continue doing business with you or not. So your employee is number one. And that's something that I think you really, you know, are, are laser focused on, aren't you? Of course, of course. Uh, the internal clients is the more important clients. You have to keep the people motivated as well. There is people that will never be motivated, no? but uh, you know, in the majority <laughs> of the cases, you need to, you need to, to motivate the people. You know, there is, there is a set saying that uh, optimistic and pessimistic people used to be equally right and wrong. But you know what? That optimistic people is happier. This is for sure. And there is a study indicating that uh, optimistic people live longer. So optimism is free. So you have something free that will make you happier and to live more. So what are you losing by taking the optimist surrounding you and in the people that is working in your projects? So yes, not to go too technical, but you know, in the in this sustainability plan in the easy plan of the company always people is in the middle of everything everything have to spin around people internal people that is your employees external people that are the citizens to which you finally has to provide a quality services yeah we spoke about vision 2030 earlier on um, um do they play a uh a role with related to water are there other goals or KPIs for water related topics as far as Vision 2030 is concerned? Well, within Vision 2030, there is a clear room for water mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, water conservation and regeneration of biodiversity is within this uh, Vision 2030. This is why Axiona is sure that we can help uh, to achieve this Vision 2030. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, as well making the management of the whole water cycle more efficient. Okay, again. <laughs> and you know, within this uh, vision 2030, that at the end of the day for me, what is, uh, is a program to open the country and let's say to involve uh, as well as Saudi more abroad of the country. And this uh, way of, of opening the country as well involve, let's say a huge program for tourists and as we say before, tourists will demand water. Water, yeah. We open water. With, yeah, yeah. And as well, the conservation of biodiversity is within the, the, let's say, the foundation of this vision 2030. And there is no other way to make this conservation of the environment but providing water. So we truly believe that, uh, you know, there are significant goals in the Saudi National Water Strategy 2030 mm -hmm. as well that is part of this vision 2030. Did you know before you arrived in Saudi Arabia that Saudi Arabia is the biggest country in the world without a river. Yeah. So I was watching this uh, show in Ramadan. Uh, Ahmed al shigari he has a show called Scene. And one of the episodes, which you should really watch if you haven't, was about the underground infrastructure of water movement in Saudi Arabia. It can wrap the globe three times. That's how much piping there is under here. And, and, and he was saying that, and it's fascinating, he was saying that 
a city like Riyadh with seven or eight million people in the desert, getting water to that city that is a couple hundred meters above sea level in an area where there's no flowing rivers or lakes so that when you wake up and you walk a couple meters to your faucet and turn it on, you have fresh water coming on. This is what needs to happen for that to be actualized. All the water piping and, and the desalination efforts that uh, to provide uh, a city like Riyadh with fresh water. That was fascinating. Right now, 70% of the water that is consumed in the cities here is provided by desalination. And the only way to desalinate water is to provide them from the sea, right? You have the East Coast and the West Coast. Mm. And this is a critical infrastructure here in the kingdom to bring those, this water, the desalinated water from the coast to the, let's say, to the cities. Yeah. Um, Riyadh is one of them, one is right in the middle, right? So it's a real challenge coming from Dubai, Hobart, um, um, and Jeddah as well. It's, it's, it's sending some kind of water to, to, to Riyadh. So it's true, but as well, 40% of the water is supplied so far by underground water. But the problem is that uh, you know you will deplenish those this this source of water if we remain at the same level that we are today. Mm. This is why we need to increase this level of uh, water, potable water, to be provided through desalination. And as well, this is why we need to incorporate more efficient ways. Let's say the increase in the efficiency. Yes, for you to 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 if we count the loss of water from the coast to the center of uh, of, of Riyadh. Maybe we are speaking 50%. And this is, this is why in the Vision 2030, you have a massive program to increase the efficiency and to reduce the losses of water all the way through the transportation of this water. But this is true. You have real lake, real underground lakes. Yeah. Real underground lakes. Consider 40% of the water today consumed in the kingdom is provided by underground water. What about a city that sees a lot of rain and where water scarcity isn't so much of an issue? How much less challenging is it to get water to a city like um, Tokyo, for example? Close to the sea, sea level, lots of rain, um, but God knows how many more million people live there. It, it, are the challenges easier? The challenges are different, right? It's to storage this fresh natural water. This is uh, where, where you know you may have the challenges, right? I mean, if there is not mountains at all, it will be difficult for you to build uh, big dams. Mm. But mm, even in that case, I will, I, I guess that the rain will not stop in the shoreline, okay? It will be raining somewhere, okay? The city should be at the sea level, but I'm sure that as well will be raining in land where you have mountains, where you can, let's say, uh, implement a massive dam and uh, which will provide you this fresh water that will require less treatment to get it the point to be potable and this to be transported to the population. At least this is how we do, I don't know in Tokyo, but at least this is how we do in Spain with, uh, let's say, the coast, what we have as well, desalination plants, but uh, not, not those desalination plants are not always working at the 100% because we have an alternative sort of water, fresh water, by those dams that uh, surround even the cities at the at the coast and dams are essentially just a storage facility that's it uh, it's a big reservoir it's you a big have reservoir. mountains mm -hmm. you put uh, let's say with concrete you define a, a closing wall let's say like this and you store it the water and and what's in the in the the, the basin or the well, basin? In the basin it depends of the of what kind of soil you have you may require to protect it or not but in spain they are so big that you never protect the soil were there any ever instances, maybe I watched too many movies, I'm not sure, but were there any ever instances or examples of when there was a problem with a dam and then the town had to evacuate or am I watching a movie right now? Well, in Spain happens once. It's in happened. The, yeah, yeah. In the, in the 80s, if I'm not no wrong, way. in Valencia, close to Valencia. And damage happened? Yeah, many people die. No way. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can happen. <laughs> and even if it rained a lot, you know, it will get full of the dam. Yeah. Uh, either it will it will go an overflow or even we destroy the wall that is closing the dump. Yeah, it's happening. Wow. It can happen, of course. It's happening not only in Spain but all around the world. Yes. So construction of dams, I think, uh, you know, currently are being built maybe when where they're not too close to cities and towns. So in the event of an issue, the town is 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 safe. 
well, you know, it's uh, sometimes it's, you need to balance. But right? then you need if to be close to the you town. Need, so you need yeah. to balance, right? You need to put the, the dam close to the, where it's going to be consumed to make it cheaper. Yeah. And you know there is always a studies of uh, flood, uh, flood how, how how will happen and to minimize and to increase the time for the reaction. What you should have is an emergency plan to, de to detect with time enough to evacuate the city mm -hmm. that uh, something something will happen. What's your dream project to work on? I know you have your hands full right now with uh, with the four mentioned clients. Is there a project that you really have your eyes on in Saudi that you would like to take or take on? Well, without putting names on this on this project, what I will dream is in the future water projects how we would like to be. Okay, we dream with a desalination plant, 100% uh, feed it with renewable energy. For this, uh, what we need to happen is this uh, breakthrough technology of battery storage uh, to come at that affordable price. So far, energy is solar, sorry, sorry, solar energy is providing energy for between eight to 10 hours to the desalination facilities or to water facilities in general. But as soon as we have affordable price for batteries storage, and this will shift, and uh, solar energy is gonna be able to provide 24 hours of energy for the water plants, not only for the desalination plants. In the wastewater treatment plant, we are getting a use for the waste Okay, for the sludge that we produce. And the target and the dream is for the salination plants to happen something similar. That is to obtain minerals out of the brine. You know, just uh, not to be too much technical from you, for to produce one liter of desalinated water, you need to take two liters from the sea. One liter will be this potable water and another liter will be brine, okay? This brine so far is disposed in the sea after doing an environmental study that's just not to arm the natural habitat of the sea. But the dream is to get minerals, what is called brine mining for this, uh, for this brine, to obtain sodium chloride, to obtain magnesium, to obtain calcium, and to make it profitable. Even the dream is to make a desalination plant a facility for minerals in which the potable water is, uh, let's say, an additional product. Mm -hmm. um, for this to happen, uh, what we need is an uh, offtaker of these minerals that are produced in the, in the, let's say, in the, in the desalination plant. So this is the dream we have in the future. Without putting any specific name, what I can assure you that is the estimation is that Saudi will be investing almost $3 billion in this uh, brain mining by 2030. What is as well part of this vision 2030, just to reduce all kind of waste in the water facilities that are developed here in the kingdom. Big investment, huh? Yeah. When you said batteries, my mind also went to batteries for solar powered cars or ele electric cars. Yeah. That, that's that's also something that uh, should be similar. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is I mean, do you feel that the the EV world is closer to us than we think? The combustion engine. I mean, if you were to take a guess, twenty years from now. Well, it's uh, it's not only about the not only the ability to manufacture cars, but as well as the infrastructure that you need to recharge in daily basis yeah. the number of cars that I've we heard. have. Yeah, yeah. The charging today. process. Okay, so do we have facilities in our home? Maybe in this home, you may have the ability to charge your car in daily basis. But if we think in a building of uh, where you have 200, 300 apartments and you are parking your car ground in the ground, it's already the facilities and the infrastructure that you need to recharge in daily basis, no? And as well, when we, I don't know, I'm, I'm not an expert in EV, but uh, I'm curious to know when you say how much is the autonomy of an electrical vehicle, you say 400 kilometers. Okay, but this is with one person in a flat, uh, let's say, place, or is uh, with full of people and sweet cases um, going to a mountain place. And you know, as well, you are in the middle of nowhere and you need to recharge. How long will it take to recharge this car to you? I don't know, but I'm not an expert in, in electrical vehicles. For sure, it's the future but I don't know the speed. This is my they're, question they're, mark. They're impressive though. I don't think people expected that that Lucid or Tesla would be as exciting as they are. Uh, Lucid is on the verge of 
releasing their new model, 800 kilometer range. And it's basically, they position themselves as, as the luxury EV. They're an impressive, impressive car. Even Tesla, you know, you've got to hand it to them. Uh, 10 years ago, electric cars were uh, perceived to be boring and the fun of the combustion engine is over. But they managed to make it better than one anticipated. Have you driven any? No, never. Okay, let's see. I'm, 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 I'm not against. I'm not saying nothing against the electric vehicle. But if you ask me, I have some question mark about about the the speed in which those cars are going to be implemented. For sure, the technology is there. But my question mark is not about the technology of the car itself or the autonomy, but the infrastructure outside the factories and the manufacturer of these cars. Is let's say the infrastructure needed uh, ready and, and deployed to 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 be able to absorb the demand for these electrical vehicles? Yeah. This is my question mark. Do we have enough supply of energy to to cover the needs of everyone driving an electric car today? And the answer is no. I think that's 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 what you're going, and that was actually one of the issues that I k kept picking up when reading about the EV is that um, there isn't enough energy right now to cover if 50% of the population were driving electric cars. Tomorrow. If, for example, we would, we would not have the supply to cover that demand. Or maybe you have the energy, but, I mean, potentially speaking, maybe you have the energy, but the energy as a whole, but you don't have the way to supply this energy where it's needed. Mm, yeah. Imagine that now, uh, you know, as I said, you are, you're going to have thousands of points in which you have to supply energy, a certain amount of energy in daily basis to recharge the car mm -hmm. or every two days. This is my, the question. Maybe the amount of energy needed, you have it, but uh, it's not, uh, let's say, distribute or available in the, in the way that you may need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. There's a shift clearly coming. The only question is when. Yeah. Um, a, a more open-ended question. Uh, if I was to ask you, why is it that you do what you do today in your role uh, as, as someone in the desalination business? What drives you towards, let's say, building a sustainable future on this planet? Well, because, you know, I'm truly convinced that uh, sustainability and, let's say, to provide projects that has a positive impact in the planet is, is the right thing to do. I mean, we only have to look at the, what we are in this planet. No? This planet uh, is having life for the, let's say, last uh, 4,000 million years, while uh, human beings, we are here for the last 200,000 years. So if we make a comparison, it's like if we make those 4,000 million years uh, a year, we are in the we are here for the last 30 minutes of the last day of the year. And the world is gonna be spinning around for coming million of years with or without us. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of whether us to decide it, whether we want to remain doing the things in the same way we are doing today, or we change and we consume less and less resources, let's say, to keep providing what is needed for the population. I am truly convinced that the only way for future generations to remain with the same quality of life that we have today is to start developing sustainable projects that will consume less energy, will consume less water, will consume less resources, and will generate less and less waste to the world. That is something that we cannot manage because I'm truly convinced. Because, you know, if, if you make a question to, today to someone, which is the most important devices that you have in your home now? So some people will say the tablet, the, you know, the the big flat screen that I have in, in, my, in my home, the phone I have, when for me the most important device that we have is the tap that allow you to open the tap and you have potable water. Definitely. You go to the toilet and you have, uh, you, you, you remove uh, what is a really risky for the health, uh, let's say, outcome from your body, what is the sewage, and you get it treated. Uh, you can switch on the light every time you want, and you have a home. So if you have potable water, you have energy, you have uh, sanitation, you have a home, and you eat three times a day, and you are sure that today you are eating three times a day, and tomorrow you are gonna be eating three times a day. 
congratulations, you are in the 35% luckiest people in the world because everybody is not, is not like this. And if we remain consuming the amount of resources for the 35% of the population to be living like this for the upcoming years, believe me, I'm not sure if in the future it's going to be the 35% of the 5%. And you need to make sure yourself to be, and your son, and your kids, to be within this 5%. Maybe it's wiser that if we find ways to do the same that we are doing today in a more sustainable way, if we generate a positive impact in the environment, if we preserve the biodiversity that we have, if we preserve our river and our sea clean of any kind of waste, and we, let's say, if we have to pay even something more to provide this solution to the society. In the long run, if we put, when we make the net present value of a project, that is we take all the cash flow of a project and we take it to the present and we see whether it is profitable or not. Okay, so this is the financial aspect of the project. But we are forgetting the not financial aspect, the impact that we are generating to the environment, the damage that we are generating. And this has as well a monetary impact. And if we put this to the present, in some cases, maybe it's negative. Okay. And this is what Acciona is doing now. We make sure that we consider the monetary or financial and the non-financial aspect of all and every projects. We evaluate all the impact, all the impact of the project, not only the monetary ones, but as well, how we impact the environment, how we impact the society. And we put all this together, only in the case that this is positive, we will move forward with a project with a deep conviction that this is the right thing to do. It's uh, thank you for painting such a realistic picture that not many people, I think, knew about because they're far from working on things that you're working on. Like yeah. you say, 35% of the globe are lucky enough to have a roof over the head and know where their next three meals are coming from. Uh, and that's a good way to live your life it could help you take care of the planet in a better way. Okay. Probably will make sure you're only using water that you absolutely need. That's Something it. as simple as when you're brushing your teeth, the tap should not be running. That's it. Uh, if you're not in a room, the light should be off. I love these automatic lights now. When you step into a room, especially in hotels and apartment buildings, when you step into a room, the lights go on. I, I think that's a good way to, uh, you know, just to, to conserve uh electricity and power but but i mean yeah it's it's deep what you said and uh, and definitely something that that touched me as i'm sure it'll touch a lot of people who heard you, you right now uh where do you find happiness in your life what makes you happy what make me happy yeah my family making me happy mm -hmm. <laughs> my family make me happy um, reading making me happy doing a sport as well make me happy um most of the time working make me happy <laughs> well, you work for your family. <laughs> That's it. So they're, they're not too far distant, those two. Speaking of your family, in the beginning, you mentioned uh, a quick story before we started shooting about your father. Uh, yeah. And uh, can, can you just tell the story again? Yeah, I always say that directly or indirectly, my whole life has been related to the water, no? because my father, uh, you know, used to have a factory for ice. You know, I'm coming, I'm, I was born in, in Cordoba, in the south of Spain, where the weather is very hot, almost like, like here in Riyadh or Jetta less humidity than in Jeddah, for yeah. sure. So I remember, no, I started working with my father even when I was 12 years old. Only this, in the factory, selling water, bringing, sorry, selling ice, uh, bringing this ice, you know, to the to the restaurant, uh, to everywhere, no, yes. Because it's, it was a need, a real need. So I always to say that my whole life has been linked to the water, no, the at the beginning in a solid way, just with the ice and now with the liquid way, just providing potable water, right? Yeah. You're not too far away from how it started, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all yeah, those yeah. years back in uh, Cordoba. We pronounce it Cordoba, how do you pronounce it in Spanish? Cordoba. Cordoba. Yeah. Cordoba. A language I wish I learned when I was younger. I should start teaching. Uh, you know son. that we are sharing 7,000 words between the Arabic and the Sharing 7,000? 7,000. 7, really? Camis, pantalon, and you know which one is the most important one? In voice. How you say in voice in Arabic? Factura. And we say in Spanish factura. <laughs> and we are daily, <laughs> dealing in daily basis yes, with facturas, yes, right? Yes, factura, yes. Some of them get paid. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. And especially with a lot of the ALs, like Al-Andalusia. Al. Al-Moada. Al yes. Now. Pillow. 
المخده you know the river of my city is uh, is Guadalquivir that is Wadi Kibir Wadi Kibir and you know yeah as well uh, have you heard Borja 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 yeah it's a very famous surname in Spain okay. and it's coming from Burja Tower okay super interesting um who if anyone would you say helped you get to where you are today not obviously you got yourself to where you are today but who taught you the skills that has helped you get to where you are today right who is responsible for your success if it's not you well i would say my my parents for sure they pushed you no they teach me that uh, the best thing you can do in the life is to be a good person mm. it always get the rewards and working hard in daily basis and never give up never never the world is not a fair place but you need to wake up every single day full of energy this is why for me what i always try to do is to keep happy all the people surrounding me to keep them motivated for the daily task and not only for my father for from my thanks to my parents but as well to my family to my current family i'm i'm taking and dedicating a lot of time that should be dedicated to them yes you know at the end of the day you say you work for your family that is true that is true right um and then this will be my answer is if it is not me for sure are the principles that my parents provided to me of hard working every day no matter what and with a smile uh, being happy and motivated in daily basis what do you tell your kids how do you motivate them what's your advice to them well that they should what i used to tell them they are very young i have a daughter of 7 years and a son of 15 so they are still starting in the life of to say in, in one way as i say before what i was teach that uh, to be a good person the most important thing in the life is to be a good person to make the people surrounding you happy not to create problem to anyone to get motivated for the knowledge in the field that you wish and to keep working in daily basis every single day mm -hmm. to learn something new every day it's a good lesson if you can learn one new thing every day be very knowledgeable by the end of the year that's it yeah Thank you very much, honestly. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, I mean, desalination. Who would have thought that I would have had someone on the show <laughs> that can tell me a thing or two about desalination and what the country's up to in this field, which many of us take for granted. We expect water to be there when we turn it on. Absolutely. We expect it to be in the cup when we want. Uh, but a lot of work happens behind the scenes. Absolutely. And it's thanks to you and, and, and the people who work uh, in, in, in your field. And to our uh, clients as well. And, and to the clients, of course, for, uh, for making water so attainable. Because there are countries where, there are countries in Africa where people have to walk kilometers and miles to get fresh water. And uh, I think the more people realize that, the more they would be more grateful for when they turn on the tap, fresh water is there. Really, I mean, I've... I've there is a, another drama behind this, what you mentioned. Tell me. You say Africa walking... 20 kilometers. You know who used to do that? Woman and child. Woman and child oh. used to carry 20, 25 kilometers. <laughs> Something that we call what? That here we will automatically throw through the toilet. That's crazy. And what is bringing this to them? Poverty, health problems, lack of education they don't go to the school they don't go to the school just to bring water and we are in a society in which if today we don't have there is a shortage of water will be a problem but the big problem is we lose the wi-fi the wi-fi will be a drama if we lose today the wi-fi connection in a home right i'll cry uh, we will cry but if we don't have water well don't worry i can go to the supermarket to get a bottle of five liters just for four stars and we have part of the world in which a woman mostly most of the cases have to because the man is supposed to be working right 
Um, and yeah, women and child, this is the reality. Where, where, where's the men in this equation? Well, the men used to be working in something else. So mm -hmm. he assumed that the water is going to be bring mainly by the woman or the child. And if that child doesn't have to go to the school, they, he will not go or she will not go. It's a lot to be grateful for. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again, Julio. Absolutely. Coming on the show. It's my pleasure. And uh, thank you again, honestly, for, for, for what you do and uh, what you have taught us during nice. this episode. At the end, it's the, it's the company I want to do that. Muchas gracias. Nada, hombre. <laughs>